Coming up on today's episode of the Salesman Podcast. Personal branding can actually act as a prospecting inbound engine for yourself as well. And that's part of why this whole thing works. I, I'm really excited to actually talk about this stuff because every time I talk to reps about this, their eyes light up with joy thinking about like the possibility of what you can do here. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm Will Barron, host of the Salesman Podcast, the world's most listened to B2B sales show where we help you not just take a sales target, but really thrive in sales. If you haven't already, make sure to click subscribe. And with that, let's meet today's guest. Hi, everyone. I'm Ryan O'Hara, VP of Marketing Growth at Lead IQ. I spent years as a BDR before I moved into marketing and I've done the nitty gritty of prospecting. I do a lot of crazy stuff with prospecting. I have fun with it. On this episode of the show with Ryan, who's a complete legend and someone you should definitely be following if you're doing lead generation day to day, especially in the SaaS or software as a service space, we're diving into essentially that lead generation, personal branding, and how it all ties together with specific archetypes so you can create content, you can do social selling, and it all fits together seamlessly. Let's jump right in. Is it a fair hypothesis to make that if you are better known within your industry, within your vertical specifically, that you can have better outcomes with your cold outreach? Yeah. So when I look at the landscape right now, there's a bunch of things that impact what works in prospecting, what account you go after, what contact you're doing, what tactic you're doing, when you're doing it, how you would actually do that tactic. And we've done a lot of stuff with standardizing our training at Lead IQ with all the BDRs and SDRs that we brought on uh, where they go through and get onboarded. And one thing kind of is something that we haven't been able to replicate is you could be as good as you want, but if you want to get your, your reply rates to be even higher, the personal brand element is a wild card that has impacted so many things for us. I'll put in a good, good example. Jeremy Levy and our team has a great online presence, talks a lot about prospecting. He's posting stuff all the time on LinkedIn, interacting with prospects. If you look at Jeremy, Jeremy will do a lot of the same exact framework that we train our other four BDRs that we have on our team to do stuff. And he gets, uh, literally, we've had him ghostwrite their emails before. And his response rates are always usually as high as plus 10, plus 11% over theirs. And our team's very good, by the way. Like we get, no one on our team, we have a threshold. No one on our team is getting below a 20% reply rate at any time. So we're really strict about like, having creative emails, being creative with the responses when you cold call. Like we're very careful about trying to keep our brand protected with the way that we do our prospecting. And I think that the element that gives Jeremy that edge, and I'm not trying to brag, but me too. I think I have a pretty good brand online that I've built. I I'll those for two, you. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. But I was going to say like both of us, when we do prospecting, get a higher response rate. And these guys are following the same exact rubric that we are, the same training and going through the same guide that we do for this stuff. I think it has something to do with like, there's, you know what I kind of picture? It's almost like, what would you do if Michael Jordan wrote you an email? If Michael jo Jordan wrote you an email, you'd be like, holy crap, Michael Jordan wrote me an email. I probably should get back to him <laughs> because it's Michael Jordan. I'm not saying Jeremy and I are Michael Jordan because we're not and I can't dunk. But like, <laughs> you know, the, the idea is that if you know someone, you're more likely to actually respond to them. So uh, and I, the fun part about this for me is, I was a BDR. I moved into marketing. And for me, I realized, man, a lot of sales reps and stuff don't actually know how to do this part because they, they, you know, they look at what their marketing teams are doing. And when you do personal branding, it's different than what a company does. Okay. So there's about 15 things to go out here. First one, I guess, to set the stage and to, to layer the priorities here, which is more effective, having a great personal brand for the average BDR, SDR, uh, account manager, me, I don't even know what my title was anymore. I think it was territory manager uh, who was kind of knocking on doors and ringing up surgeons. Is it more important as a first step to get the framework correct or is personal brand all we should be focusing on? So obviously you need to be able to do normal prospecting. The thing I'm getting at is like the guys on our team, for example, might get around a 20 to 30% response rate. Uh, last time I did prospecting, for example, I did a, I was doing a webinar. So I actually just did a bunch of experiments and then reported on the findings for the webinar we did for Lead IQ. And I did doing same tactics these guys do, except for the webinar, I had a 51% response rate. And these guys were, I, I was just doing our normal rubric of personalization, doing stuff that was really clever and creative and different, talking about a prospect more than us. The only difference is my name and what I'm doing online. And I think that there is something there. So you have to be able to do the basic fundamentals of prospecting in order to actually get responses. 
the thing that will milk and get you even higher rewards and returns on what you're doing is if you add that personal branding aspect to it. And then the other cool part that people don't realize is that personal branding can actually act as a prospecting inbound engine for yourself as well. And that's part of why this whole thing works. I, I'm really excited to actually talk about this stuff because every time I talk to reps about this, their eyes light up with joy thinking about like the possibility of what you can do here. So we'll come on to inbound in a second and we'll perhaps even wrap up the show with that because that's a whole segment on itself. But there's something here that I think is important and it was only in pondering this conversation with you, Ryan, this morning that I came across this realization because I always use the example of if um, Richard Branson emailed me, called me, even if it was his secretary, I'd be like, holy moly, kind of holding myself back from swearing then of immediately I drop everything I'm doing. I'd be sorry, Ryan, can't record with you. I've got to send a problem maybe i'll ring you up i've got to send this incredible email i need your help i need to rope you in to to help me get back to him you know him or if as a secretary as well so there seems like multiple layers of this though because there's awareness within the marketplace which maybe is what we mean when we mean personal branding versus celebrity or actual brand so richard branson is uh, a celebrity so we all know him by name i'm not so aware on i assume he's an incredible salesperson but i don't know specifically whether he would be how how am i going at this let me let me let me me pull this back so if if i was to go if you to email me i'd go on your linkedin profile i would see your your title your title's vp right yep so i'd see i'd see vp i'd be thinking very important person i need to get back to this individual very quickly now that's one element of it i feel like another element of this is which is perhaps what more what we're in control of which is the amount of um, attention that you have, the number of times you pop up in someone's feed if you've connected with them on LinkedIn. All this adds a, a level of rapport, a level of trust, even if it's subconscious. So when we're talking about personal brand here, just again to, to get the, the, the story straight, are we discussing the awareness that people have about us in the market or are we t- discussing celebrity, fancy job titles and, and other perceived ways of uh, improving the, the potential value of a conversation before we have it, if that makes sense? I think I think the way that I look at it is a personal brand is a way for people to be familiar and discover you individually. And if more people see and get eyeballs on you, it's going to create more outbound. It's going to make your outbound better because those people already be familiar with you. I'll give you a perfectly good example with a story about it. Again, everyone listening, I'm not trying to brag. That's not my style. I'm just telling you this so you can steal what I do and do it because no, I'm I'm just a normal guy. Like anyone can do this stuff. Um, this past summer, uh, drift had a conference in Boston, uh, hyper growth. It was this bit, it was in a palladium outside big arena, really great speakers and stuff. I went down cause I wanted to see a couple of the talks that were there and I was walking down to get seats in this one section. And as I was walking down to get seats, I sat down and this, I sat down, I pull out my phone naturally to get on the Wi-Fi, and I look and my LinkedIn notifications is just blown up with like literally 10 direct messages on LinkedIn. And it's just people that messaged me and said, I see you at Hypergrowth. I'd love to meet you. And I, I was like, holy crap. I feel like I actually did. Like, I'm just a normal guy, but all these people see me every week putting content out on LinkedIn. They're seeing me put videos out there. They're seeing me put blog posts and commenting on things. And because of my frequency of doing something and all the time I put into my personal brand, they just recognize me. They recognize this really awkward guy with a Muppet haircut walking down to his seat. So like that, like that's, that's something there's something there. And by the way, we turned some of those into opportunities there too. Yep. I know we got at least four opportunities from there. It wasn't a conference where you go mingle and there's a floor, like there's no expo. It was literally talks, 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 and then you leave. But we still were able to generate and uh, get some opportunities out of it because people wanted to meet me having seen some of the stuff that we've done. I, this is a real thing that you can do. And I, by the way, I'd love to get, go into like how you actually do this. That's kind of what I'd like to go and do for this too. But to like, I'll, I'll tell you one more story to try and sell you on this a little bit more. Uh, this past summer, I drive a moped and I live about 20 minutes from the coast. So like there's an ocean here. My friend and I, uh, my friend Drew, uh, we both were on mopeds and we mopeded to the ocean and I'm wearing a helmet and a bathing suit and I don't look like how I look anywhere on anything. <laughs> and I'm driving on right on route one a in New Hampshire. If people don't know where that is, it's a beautiful coastline and someone pulls over. I'm parking my moped. Someone pull, pulls over and says, Hey, are you Ryan O'Hara? And I'm like, 
yeah, I am. And I was just so completely shocked. They're like, I love your stuff on LinkedIn. And they knew who I was, even though I'm just like a normal jerk who like 10 years ago lived in my mom's basement. So like, you know, I think of this stuff and I think, man, if this personal branding stuff has power, because we write, we write back to people when I write emails, people, a lot of the time they'll write back and be like, they'll be like, wow, this, like there are people that know that I write really good cold emails and stuff. And they'll write back to me and say, this was a good one. I, I'm glad it didn't disappoint because they already had a reputation for me. So I, a big part of this is like not only being able to actually have this guide what you're doing outside of work. The big thing with personal branding is it should be a compass for you on how you do your prospecting too. Uh, and that's, it, what, what does it that mean, be, Ryan? Yeah. So, all right, I'll, I'm going to go into something and p some people that are marketing have probably heard about this before, but this is super amazing and really cool. If I go and round up, I'm not trying to crap on any companies, but if I go and round up a bunch of companies, what do you think is the biggest difference between Disney and General Electric? Um, attention. Yeah, like that's actually a pretty that's a pretty good answer actually. I'll but take that. The, Great. <laughs> I I think the the answer that I generally am trying to tee off there is like the brand. There are people sure, that sure. there are I, people love Disney, right? As opposed to GM, big corporate conglomerate. Yeah, like who gives a I'm shit? not knocking with General Electric, for example. I use GE as an example because GM does do a brand thing too like there are people that are like super fans of corvette for example so like i don't want to like go and say that about a car company but with ge they make tons of stuff they make appliances they make light bulbs they make uh, weapon stuff like they do all these different things the difference with ge and disney is that disney's brand is way more valuable i think if you rounded up everybody in a room and said which one of these things are you more familiar with and which one do you feel more loyalty to there's a reason people line up the door every weekend to go see every Pixar movie. But when DreamWorks comes out with a 3D animation movie, the box office numbers aren't the same as a Pixar movie. And that's because of the brand. People hug and like Disney because of the brand. And the reason that they like their brand is because Disney does a thing called brand archetyping. And this is the compass I'm talking about with prospecting. Brand archetyping is a framework where our mind as a consumer, as a prospect, we, we have this thing where we actually consume and want to see patterns of, and we try to categorize everybody. And the idea with brand archetyping is that you can pick one of these brand archetypes. And if you commit to it the whole time, it's a lot easier for people to feel and see the pattern that you have and get more comfortable with you. And as a result, they'll actually start to think that they're your friend. It's uh, this stacks another theory called media friend theory. And this is a good example. We both might watch something like I like Conan O'Brien, for example, I watched a lot of Conan O'Brien show on TBS. I'll go watch clips online. I don't really watch it online. I'm a cable cutter. So like I don't have a cord cutter, so I don't have cable. But like I'll watch like clips of Conan online and stuff. I feel like I know Conan really well because I have watched his show every day. Even though I've never met this guy and we have nothing in common, I feel like I know you every day because I listen to your podcast. So when we're talking, whenever we get on these calls, it always takes 20 minutes for us <laughs> to start because I feel like we're chums yeah. and friends. And we, we probably we definitely be friends if we hung out in real life and stuff, but like outside of podcast world, the idea is that with a personal brand, if you pick an archetype, you'll be able to create more of a persona that people want to buy into. Uh, and I can, uh, that's a big part of how this works. I'll tell you the 12 archetypes. Hopefully off the top of my head, I don't screw any of them up. Well, let, let's, let's not go through the 12, Ryan, because uh, okay, that's, that's going to be okay. a lot to digest if someone's listening in the car. Are there, are there three, four of them that would be applicable to salespeople specifically, or are they are, are they just so widespread that we need to go? Yeah. So, them so here's the here's the deal. There is no right archetype. The way that you pick an archetype for yourself, this is basically how you make your content online. What you do in your videos. How do you sound in your prospecting emails? What do you do in a cold call? This is your compass for everything that you do to build a brand for yourself. When I write a cold call, I'm sorry. When I write a cold email, my cold email. I so for me, for example, I'm a gesture brand. So I try to make people laugh. I try to entertain them. I tried to, uh, I'm like Ben and Jerry's, the ice cream company. Like they make goofy flavors and have fun and do a lot of that stuff. That's my approach. And the reason I do that is because I looked at the industry and saw all these people that were doing stuff in sales. There's a ton of hero brands out there that talk about how awesome they are. Uh, there's a, like a ruler brands, another one, like think of Muhammad Ali, right? Muhammad Ali talked about how great he was. That's what a ruler brand does. Um, these are examples of different archetypes. Harley Davidson's a rebel brand. So like when someone's like, I'm going to break the law, I'm going to be a badass. I'm going to go punch a jukebox, make music start. <laughs> uh, uh, obviously that's things that rebels do. 
that's what Harley Davidson does. That literally all their framing and their copy and their ads and stuff is about reinforcing that. Here's the beautiful part, Will. Every single one of these archetypes is in all of us. We all feel like these things at different times. So if you pick one of these archetypes and commit all your content and all the stuff that you're selling and doing to that archetype, you're going to appeal to everyone no matter who they are. That's why it doesn't work for just one rep. And But the secret is you pick one archetype and you commit to that archetype with everything that you do. You don't pick three and say, I'm going to sometimes do this and sometimes do this. You commit to one so that you get a pattern and your email content, your cold call content, your post on social, your interactions, your comments, all that stuff, that online personality that you have is consistent. And it's easier for people to frame and wrap around that guy. I know what that guy is all about. You know what I mean? I get it. So you're trying to make yourself um, viral by giving other people a seamless way to describe you, right? Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. The idea is that you want to seem interesting. Uh, my favorite example of this is anyone here that listens and likes Star Wars knows the Star Wars prequels are notoriously hated by Star Wars fans. You know why? It's because all the Star Wars prequels have boring characters and don't have good adjective. Like the adjective, it's not what happens in it, it's how they delivered it. If I can't tell you anything about Guy Guan Jin, he's boring. And he was, you know, he's in the first Star Wars movie uh, or Phantom Menace. But if I go back to the original Star Wars, Luke Skywalker is a hero brand archetype. Uh, he's got some everyman elements too. If I go to uh, Han Solo, the reason we love Han Solo is because he's a rebel brand. He's a rogue. He's a rebel. He goes against the grain. He breaks the law. He doesn't care because he's a badass. And he wears a vest, even though it's not cold in space. What's up with that? But And then you have people that do things for like comic relief, like you, or, or you have a sage brand. Sage brand's another popular one. That's where you're the smartest person in the room. That Obi-Wan Kenobi is a perfect example of that if you go through Star Wars. So think of that, or you could keep putting out content blindly with no brand strategy. And the brand strategy you're putting out, you're going to be like Guy Guan Jin and no one's going to care about you. So, so I will ask you to run through these very quickly because I think the, the names describe <laughs> them pretty pretty easily. So I, I don't think it's going to be kind of full. I, I don't want to engineer a 14-minute monologue, although I'd be happy, happy listening to it. But what I will say is um, if you've got a blog post, you can share on this. If not, I'll write a blog post up and link it in the show notes to, to go through it. Um, but before, before we run through the 12, is this a personality type that we kind of shift ourselves to be towards? For example... I would love to be the rebel uh, person I'd say from the sound of things, but it's probably not a, a, a bit. There's a bit of that in there, I guess, with the, the podcast and the underdog kind of story of the show versus the the, the bigger podcast that we went up against and just smashed download uh, download numbers wise or uh, kind of month in month out. But is this something that we have to be realistic of ourselves? Of I am probably this personality type, or or my personality type pushing me towards this archetype, and so that's what I should commit to? Or is there a little bit of narrative? Do we have a little bit of leeway involved with some of this? So what I recommend is this. What you should do if you're trying to pick one of these archetypes, uh, and this is what reps get really excited about, is you should look and say, what am I already good at? What's natural to me? So if you're very natural at like, good example, a ruler brand's very good at talking smack. Like they'll talk trash. They don't mind crapping on their competition. That like I don't necessarily like that quality for me. I like, but I appeal, like, there's an appeal to me. I love Tom Brady and he's the greatest quarterback of all time. Tom Brady's a ruler brand and will only do stuff with like high end brands and stuff with this stuff, but I relate to him still. So there's a different way to execute it. What I recommend is this look at what you are good at, pick a couple of the archetypes that we mentioned here that you like, well, the qualities that you like about these archetypes. Here's the second part that you have to do look at what other people in your industry are doing. And if they're doing that archetype, don't. Don't do that archetype. Look at Lead IQ, for example. And I'm not, I don't know if I'm allowed to mention other vendors and stuff, but like we can say whatever you want. Okay, okay. Whatever is appropriate for your archetype, uh, Ryan, dive into it, mate. Yeah. So I'm going to disclose this. Lead IQ is a data company. We help people get prospect data. One of the things that stinks is like there's a ton of these tools out there that do this. You could buy Discover War, you could get Zoom Info. I know I'm mentioning my competition here. I hope you check out Lead IQ. That's fine. But these guys, I looked at them when I joined Lead IQ and thought, man, these companies, I, I love, I think they're great. I've been customers of theirs at other companies and stuff, so I don't want to speak ill of them, but they don't really have a brand that has a personality. I can't write down five adjectives for their brand. Uh, if I go through other brands, though, like a Disney, I could write those things down. So for me, I, I remember when I joined Lead IQ, I was like, I'm not going to build a GE, even though it could make a lot of money and be a big company. I want to build a brand. I want to build a Disney. And that's kind of the appeal of what we've tried to do here. 
Uh, and there's a big difference between it. So uh, for me, I think what you really need to do is you need to look at what you're good at and then you need to write down some adjectives and then put those adjectives into categories. And th those adjectives should be things you want to be. And if you like one of the categories that comes up and it looks like your competitors aren't doing that individually or on a company level, take that and make that your archetype. And, and it'll, just, be a little, it'll be a lot easier. I'll just give another quick layer on top of this. And I've talked about this on the, the show before, so I won't dive into it too deep. But with the sales school, our kind of quote unquote sales training product, if you love the podcast, essentially that's the sales pitch. You're going to love the content in there. New video workshop, uh, hour long video workshop every week. I did what you described, Ryan, of everyone, the, the sale, it was a $2.2 .2 billion industry, the sales training industry. And it's mostly dudes in weird fitting, ill fitting suits and women in power suits looking at a whiteboard or, or a PowerPoint presentation, going through the five ways to cold call and really piss people off over the long term. So we did the exact opposite. So we don't do sales training. We do, my take on it is that if you're a good business person, if you're almost entrepreneurial in your role, which I think it's safe to say you are with the, the creative work that you're doing, you're going to do well. You don't need to know all the weird ticks and tricks and tactics if you are a, a true thought leader in your space, even if you narrow it down so niche that for me, I've just got to be the best medical device rep uh, covering endoscopes here in Yorkshire, kind of a two and a half hour circle around my house. If I do that, I've won all the business and I've smashed my target. So our content is all self-development content as opposed to weird 80s sales manipulation, manipulation tactics. Then we've got a bunch of characters. We've got an illustrator on board and all the content is 100% not appropriate to be used on a, on a corporate machine or a corporate computer if you've, if you've got your sales manager looking over your shoulder going through the content. Because of that, it's entertaining. And we did exactly what you're describing, um, almost almost blindly. Uh, so I probably could have strategically put it together after this conversation uh, a lot more appropriately and had more, more focus. But I just did the exact opposite of what everyone else is doing. And it's taken off. It's doing it's doing far more revenue than kind of anything else, any other products, any other um, the, the podcast, the advertising, everything else that we've ever done. The sales school is just smashing it all. Purely down to, just because I want to reemphasize this point, purely down to the fact that it's different. It, it may be better. It may be just as good as some of the, the um, there's different sales training companies out there that I have people on the show regularly from, and they do an incredible job as well. But because it's different, it stands out, it's shareable, it's semi-viral, again, within it, within a small niche. And that's the reason it's having success. So with that, Ryan, and kind of just doubling down and not wanting to kind of, uh, you you were humbly trying not to pitch Lead IQ then. I use Lead IQ for the audience. I'll, I'll, I'll say it. I uh, have all the content, all the um kind of tools out there. I use it specifically. And you might not even know this, Ryan. Um, I don't, I think you comped me account, uh, comped me an account a year ago. I pay for it. I'm, I'm a paying customer for you guys. So I don't know if you knew that or not, but I, I did I, not know that. Yeah. That makes me excited. I, I love the, I love the product, <laughs> mate. So with that said, um, give us these 12 archetypes and then perhaps I'll touch on one or two of them and we can use them as an example, or even better. You can tell us, you can give me and the podcast some direction here of where you think we fit within these 12 archetypes when we've been through them and perhaps what, what we can do better to, to improve my personal brand and, and the brand of the show. Yeah. So uh, by the way, I, I think that you do a great job of branding the podcast. Like for what you do, you've got the red color. You talk about that's like, you've got some stuff that goes against the grain. It's flashy. It's high production. It's like, it's very different than a corporate podcast that a lot of other people put out. Um, so I'll run through them really quick. There's the ruler brand. The ruler brand's big thing is talking about how great they are. They want people to know that they're great. And it sounds kind of arrogant when you hear it, but it works. There's a reason that we all know Muhammad Ali, but we don't know another boxer that you've never heard of because Muhammad Ali talked the best. Conor McGregor's another one, right? How often does he talk? Like, everyone knows who he is. That guy has talked himself into a career, basically. <laughs> the, the other one is the lover brand. Lover brands talk about being, they basically share intimate things. So like, you're on the phone with a customer, you might be like, Hey, I'm going to tell you something. Don't tell anyone else this. And you might say something like that. You might show, you show a lot of love. You use the word love in your stuff. Classic example of that would be like Victoria's Secret. It's not just like sexual stuff though. It could also be like, I, like you could just show love for your customer and stuff and show intimacy. That's the big part about that. Rebel Brand, one of my favorite ones. That's about going against the, the grain and breaking the laws, kind of. Uh, good example that a lot of people, I mentioned earlier was Harry Davidson. Some people put, some of the marketers out there will say that when Apple made a comeback, they did this brand archetype. They, their whole tagline in the early 2000s was think different. That's actually breaking a grammar law. Technically, if you're being grammatically correct, the, the tagline for Apple should have been think differently. But their whole, what they realized is that when they're, when, before Steve Jobs came back, they were struggling in sales. 
they went and surveyed the people that actually had stuck around. And the big reason they had stuck around is because people wanted to buy something that wasn't a PC. They wanted to go against the grain. So Apple said, let's double down on that and let's make it so that like you can pick us as an alternative. And that's a way you could value prop, by the way, your pr product when you're selling. Um, the Sage, you basically, you're basically you all about being enlightened and learning information and teaching using lessons and stuff. One of my mentors at Dying, Kyle York, actually is a Sage brand. He's always telling stories about people he's met, what he learned from the encounter. He uses the word lesson a lot if you do like a control F on his profile. I always use him as an example. The next is the magician. They're all about making your dreams come true. Magicians do stuff to surprise people. They do stuff that almost seems like unrealistic and crazy. Like Disney's a good example. If you ever go to a Disney place like a resort or you look at their movies, every acquisition they've done has been all about trying to take you out of this world a little bit. And that's part of what they do there. Like, I don't know if that would work for a rep here if you if you if you can't realistically pull it off. But if you can do some cool stuff, maybe you surprise your customers by sending them something that's really pleasant that they wouldn't expect or you do something that goes above and beyond what they were expecting to do something uh, that could be really great. The caregiver is another one where that's kind of like a mother like quality where like, you know, Campbell's soup does this, for example, Hey, or have some soup. Uh, you take care of your customers. You focus heavily on like sh sh talking about it out loud in the content that you do. You tell stories about how you're taking, how you're there for them if they need anything. The explorer is all about trying experiments. Um, Jeep Land Rover are both good examples of that. They go and they go and like adventure. Think Indiana Jones for a character. That's what you're branding yourself as. I tried this experiment today. I might be wearing the, I might have this whip and I'm like going around. You know what I mean? Like you might brand yourself that way when you're doing your content. The gesture is what we try to do. It's mainly about entertaining people, trying to make them laugh, trying to, you know, focus mainly on having fun and making it a fun brand. Uh, the innocent, this is about simplicity. So like if you pitch your product in a cold email and you make your copy really simple, and your value prop's just really simple. That's kind of a good archetype for you. The hero, that's someone that wants the ball when the game's on the line. That's the person that's going to save the day. It's a very popular archetype right now um, in the sales world that people do unintentionally. I don't think they mean to. The everyman, that's all about like relating to the person, being their friend. Very popular archetype. And the last one's the creator. And that's about building. The thing that you do when you're doing these archetypes these impact your value prop for selling your company. So if I'm a creator archetype and I'm selling to IT and network engineers, I might talk about like in my value prop, be like, hey, I, I heard you're building some really cool projects. I'd love to learn more about the empire you're building. Like you might word your questions in your cold email and your cold call about that. And that's that's part. And then when you do your copy and you put videos out on LinkedIn or you're posting something on LinkedIn or whatever channel you're using for this stuff, you're tweeting something. The thing that you're putting out is actually like wrapped around that archetype. I'm, I'm sorry I'm ranting a little bit, but like it's important. This impacts everything that you do if you pick an archetype. Okay, so I want you to give us some consulting on where we should go with the podcast and myself in a second. But before that, then I want to wrap up at the end of the show, because I'm conscious of time here, Ryan, with the inbound elements of all of this. But how much of this is perceived? How much of this is I say I'm X, Y, Z, and so the customer, the end user, whoever it is who's a gauge of us goes, oh, that must be what they are until they prove themselves differently. And how much of this, how much, what percentage of it is perceived and how much of this is earned of, if you're the, the dude or the girl, I think it was the hero who wants the that wants the, the, the ball just outside the, the three point mark with less than a second to go, who's gonna take that shot. How much of it do you have to earn and actually do before that's cemented in the mind of the prospect? Yeah, so it takes a long time. So what actually made me discover this was I saw a talk, this guy, Kevin Skerritt, did a talk on this, and I was a BDR at the time. And at Dine, where I used to work, we had just rebranded. We had two brands that we merged into one, and they just rebranded everything. And I went to the marketing team and was like, guys, we got to do this brand archetyping stuff. I'm totally convinced. It sounds really cool. We got to try and do this. And they were like, we just spent millions of dollars rebranding. Uh, you're too late. <laughs> maybe next time. And so I was like, crap, what am I going to do? And so I came up with the idea of just doing it myself. Like, oh, I'll just try this ex this exercise on myself and see if it works. And I ended up going with the gesture brand then too. I, I like doing the gesture brand. It's fun for me. Like I like making people laugh. It feels good. I like trying to do some stuff that's a little outside the box to focus on entertainment. If I'm you and you're listening to this, it's you have to do it for a long time. No, one, the customer shouldn't be aware of it. So like 
you shouldn't be making a video that's like, hey, everyone, I'm an explorer brand, so I'm going to explore. That's not what it is. What it is is you might go say, hey, hey, everyone, this week I tried this experiment. Let me tell you what happened. That's an example of being an explorer brand. You don't just go spell out what you are. So you earn it through doing tactics over time. People like I get people all the time that will message me on LinkedIn that will say, hey, I saw your last video, Ryan. It was really funny. And I didn't go and say this video is funny. Ha ha. You know what I mean? Like. I'm not a mom trying to be hip with the times or something, you know, like my whole style is meant to like solidify this slowly and make you realize it through this cadence. So like if you're doing sales and you're prospecting someone, you might, here's a, here's a way you can actually apply this. I might, and this kind of links into the inbound discussion, but I might post a video online. Someone might like or comment it. If I, my video, if, if I'm a gesture brand and my video is funny, if I go write a cold email to them, and it's super serious, isn't that going to disappoint them? Like, wouldn't you be disappointed if you're like, man, this guy has a hell of a personality. I got to work with this guy. Holy crap. And then I message him and say, hey, I saw you liked my video. I actually been trying to prospect your account for a little while, but I haven't had any luck. This is what it's been like. And then I like, I make a little bit or a joke or something in the email. If I don't follow up and do the same thing, I'm going to disappoint the person. And it's it's not congruent, right? It's difficult to build trust with someone when you when they're wishy washy like that. You don't know which is the the real version that you're actually dealing with. This is one of the reasons I hate when I get emails or calls and it's someone with a super corporate, straight down the line voice and vocal tonality, and there's no uh, joking and there's no room for just a, a conversation outside. The, before we jumped on the call, me and you were talking about RGB keyboards and computer games. That is congruent with kind of you and I and our previous conversations. And so I feel like there's a bit more rapport there. There's a bit more trust. So it all comes back to that, right? Yeah, I think that if you want to create trust for your prospects and have something that's consistent, you have to be the same person no matter what happens. It's that simple. And the fun part about this is this becomes your compass to produce content later. If you're a rep right now and you're struggling to do the social selling stuff or like you're engaging and commenting on posts or you're putting out content every week and posting something, it can take a little while to come up with what, what content you want to do. But if you know, I'm going to put out this content, it has to be funny because I'm a gesture. I picked the gesture brand or I'm putting out this content. It has to be about the create. I it has to be about how I'm building something this week because I'm a creator brand. Whatever you pick, it becomes a guide and compass for what you actually do with your content every week. And it becomes faster for you to think of content. So Ryan, you know our content, you've been on the show a bunch of times. What, what should we be heading towards? Because I feel like I'm about seven out of the 12 of those archetypes. If you were my sales manager, because as you know, I still sell the, the advertising podcast, the, the advertising on the podcast and, and other products as well. So I'm still selling every single day. What should be my personal archetype, which obviously is indirectly or directly tied in with the brand of the, the show in that? Where should we, what should our compass be? So I look at you and I I know you outside of the podcast and talk. We always talk like for an hour before we actually record these things. I, I think given your background, like I know you're into drumming and you're into gaming and like all this cool stuff. I actually think you'd be a really cool rebel brand. Like you're not very corporate-y, which is cool. I love that you just go and speak and do these things. Like you, you could go against the grain. And what that would mean is basically you don't, you kind of lead the charge on telling people new information. And the, the framework of anything with a rebel brand is, hey, you're doing it that way. We need to break that rule. This is the way you actually should do it. And it's all about rules being made to be broken. I think a lot of the content you put out there unintentionally turns into that. The titles that, like you'll go do an interview with like Jack Kazakowski, for example, a uh, good friend of ours. And like, you'll go do an interview with him and your tagline will be, this is what people are doing wrong. This is what you need to be doing instead. That's usually the framework of that. That's a typical rebel brand. It'd be an easy transition for you. Good. Well, I think the, mid show i actually said i'd love to kind of that was the one that jumped out of me as the cool one to go after so i appreciate that and uh, hopefully it, i'll be interested with the audience to see if they see if this, this is now conscious in my brain moving forward if they see this uh, and they can relate to it moving forward i don't think i don't think that a lot of people in the podcast world either are doing that so like if you did a landscape of all the other sales podcasts that you shouldn't listen to listen to <laughs> you should definitely listen to will barrett is good uh, <laughs> no like if you were gonna go like if you're going to go look at all the other podcasts that are out there and, and take a landscape of it and you wrote down those words, I don't think there's any of them that are like, Hey, you're doing this wrong. Do this. So that, yeah, I mean, that might be a part of it. it it's kind of like adding a little bit of attitude into it a little bit more too. But I, I think you'd be good at that. Knowing your bat, like there's an appeal that we all have listening to this podcast to counterculture. We all do it. 
even if you're listening to this, you're like, oh, I don't really break the rules. There's still something that you've probably done. There's a reason punk rock is a genre for music. You know what I mean? Like people listen to punk because it was counterculture when it came out originally. And the same thing applies to all this other stuff too. So you got to think about that stuff. So, and, and we'll come on to Inbound and wrap up with this second, but I went to watch Lesson Jake, Real Big Fish, and someone else the other day. I don't know you're into kind of a pop punk and, and these kind of bands as well. I did a, um, a Instagram story uh, kind of as we were there, and I got so many messages of people going, I didn't know you are into this kind of music. So the, even stuff like this that's going on in the background and your hobbies perhaps even could fall into it, right? And it's another way to build a relationship, build rapport with individuals, Um on a, on a deeper level by doing things that you're already doing, right? Yeah, I think I think a big thing here is like, look at me, for example, when I was younger, I remember I, when I was in high school and college, I remember being like, man, I wish I could write comedy, but I don't have the courage. I don't know if I'm good enough at it. And I literally am a coward. Like, it's not practical for me. You know how many people you hear go and try and do that for a living and then never make it. And then they live out of a box and they're poor and they're living in their parents' basement and they're like 50. Like, I didn't want to be that. So the cool part, though, is I can do the gesture archetype, not have to be all out on like, haha, funny for a living and still make a good living out of it and make people like lead IQ. And it it works. I There are people that like I it's not manipulating people either. Like I, I actually like I want to get on a call with someone when I book a call after qualifying them. I want to laugh with them on the call. I want to yuck. I want to, you know, I want to be able to be honest with them so I can. It, the cool part too is you build a better rapport with these people too when you do this. Um, so that's that's the magic behind it. And I I th- every time I tell people about this, they get really excited and jazzed up about it because it gives you ideas and says, oh, I can pick this archetype. This is my brand now. This is what I'm going to do. And it's very easy to execute on once you pick one. Love it. Well, what I'm gathering from the conversation, Ryan, is, is congruence. That seems like the most important thing here. Going with your, uh, some of it's probably going with your gut as well. But final thing to wrap up. How does all this translate into inbound? Because what we've talked about so far is basically pushing a message, a narrative, winding it into conversations that are perhaps already ongoing. But how does this translate into the holy grail of B2B sales, which is people coming to you? All right. So there's three things that I'm going to talk about really quick. The first is it's really important for you to work with your marketing teams at these companies. Marketing and sales teams fight all the time. And it's really sad. It happens all the time. What you need to do is you should you should want to be a face of your company. And if you're a marketing person for some reason listening to this, you need to make your reps faces your company. If you think your rep isn't good enough to talk out there to the masses, why are you hiring them as a sales rep? They shouldn't be talking to customers. Like that's my perspective on that. So you need to like make your reps extensions of your brand as a marketer. We did that at Lead IQ. Every single person that we work with next year. I'm hiring a content producer to literally go sit down and help reps bang out content all, all, all year. Wow. So once a week, they'll, they'll do a 30 minute recording session, record something, and they'll cut it and splice and do all the work for the rep because that's working for us. You need to make your reps part of your brand. The second part is if you're going to be producing content, uh, one of the things you need to do is if you put it out there, you need to prospect the people that are engaging with it and let that drive some of your accounts and stuff. So if I go put out a video and Let's say, Will, you came in and liked or commented on the video. I'm going to go find Will Barron. I'm going to go get his contact information. I'm going to prospect him. Whenever I mention that content, I'm going to follow up on. Good example. Uh, about two weeks ago, I made a video that was it was called Seven Prospecting Tips. And it was a complete joke video. It was fake prospecting tips that you never want to do. One of the things that we did in the video that people laughed at is we said, if you're really a sales baller, you should send a contract in your first cold email. <laughs> like just send a contract and say, Hey, waiting for you to sign. Thanks. Yep. And it was a complete joke. Don't do that. If you're listening to this, I'm completely joking. If you watch the whole video, you know that it's a joke. Cause I tell you at the end, it's a joke, but, uh, we had a bunch of people like it. I think it got like 10 or 15,000 views. Any person that we saw that commented or liked it, we prospected our reps sent contract emails to them to prospect them as a knowing that they watched a video. So like if someone liked the status or liked the video, they're get, now getting an email from <laughs> our reps with a contract. So they're in on the joke and yeah. they feel like they, they, a lot of them just wrote, you know, ha ha back, uh, baller move. And then they write back and actually pitch them. So like you can use this to drive up who you're prospecting throughout the day and you'll start seeing people get direct messages and recommend you and tell people about you. Uh, and that's how it drives inbound. Another thing you can do 
is at when you post anything online or you're posting content or videos or whatever you're doing, you should always have a call to action. So like, don't just go post something and say, Hey, thanks. I'm talking, blah, 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 blah. See you next time. Instead say, shoot me an email here and give your email out at the end of a piece of video that you do. If you do a blog post, have a button, maybe it goes to your calendar. If you're using calendar software, if you're a marketer or you have your marketing team helping you make a landing page just for you, ask your marketing team to make a landing page just for you and drive people there. Any of these equations can work really well for you, but that's how you create inbound. And the cool part is if you set it up properly, it'll all go into your name anyway in Salesforce and stuff. Perfect. Well, I feel like uh, we cut it a little bit short there. That's probably, we'll do a part two of that. If you're, we'll do a part two of this episode. We'll dive into inbound into more details because there's about 478 questions I could ask on the back of that, especially on the CTA, the call to action element of this, because that's something that's, I regularly screw up on myself. I'm happy to put stuff out there to have conversations not and not, not, direct it to somewhere that's a useful place for both me and the potential customer to go to. So I'll uh, I'll jot that down and we'll have a, another conversation about that in the, in the future, Ryan. But with that, mate, I've got one final question. I've asked it you um, about 14 times now. I'm going to ask you again, and I'm in the show notes this episode, I'll go back and review your answers and I'll, we'll do, do a list and see how similar they all are. But with that, Ryan, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at selling? Wow. That's, that's deep. I think the biggest thing that I wish I had done years ago is had a little bit more empathy for what my prospect and customer is going through. Just so full disclosure for people listening, I've never been a closer. I've only been a prospector. So like I went up the ranks in prospecting, not, not in closing. But when I was prospecting, I used to try tactics all the time where I thought that like, oh man, I'm going to send a song to a prospect, but the song would be about my company and not about the prospect. And then they wouldn't respond and I'd be like, I don't get it. I, and now that I'm older and wiser, I realized, oh, if I had done the same amount of time and thought that I put into the prospecting email I sent to them, but made it more about them than me, I would have been in a better spot. So be empathetic. Think about what, put yourself in your prospect's shoes. Amazing stuff. Well, with that, Ryan, tell us a little bit more about Lead IQ, where we can find it, and then where we can find you on LinkedIn, because I want everyone to obviously follow and follow from the selfish perspective of seeing what Ryan is doing correct so that we can just uh, copy it within our own archetype and, and do something similar. Ooh, that's pressure. So uh, you can go check out Lead IQ. We're helping a lot of people with getting contact information enriched. We go take first name, last name, company name. You can go on any website. LinkedIn's one of the more popular ones because people want to get their stuff into their CRM. You hit one button, it'll push it to Salesforce. You use Salesloft or Outreach or one of those guys, you can push it right into that at the same time. And it'll go get you all the contact information for the prospects you're going after. For me, you can go, I think it's Ryan M. O'Hara on LinkedIn. Like if you search linkedin.com slash Ryan M. O'Hara, or you can just look for my name. Uh, I'm on there. There's a lot of stuff that we put out. Another thing that I'd recommend is uh, if you're just starting out, hit me up and I'm happy to talk to anyone. Just talk to me on direct message on there and we can chit chat about some ideas if you're getting stuck or you want more information about this. Because a lot of people, I feel bad, but if you work in sales, you don't necessarily know everything because you haven't had a chance to learn this stuff. I've had plenty of time and money thrown my way for like trying to experiment with this stuff in marketing. And now I'm trying to help reps do it individually. So perfect. Well, I'll link to all that in the show notes over at salesman.org. And with that, Ryan, I, I genuinely enjoyed these conversations with you, mate. I will say for the audience as well, it's Ryan's day off and he's hanging out with us. So we all appreciate it. Sales Nation appreciates it, mate. And with that, I want to thank you again for joining us on the Salesman podcast. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it.